Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've been doing uh, API talks and talks on libraries for a little while now, and I always hear there's a bit of a dry topic. So thank you for showing up, and hopefully I can help you make your libraries a little bit more Kotlin friendly. So just before we get in a little bit about me, uh, my name's Kyle Thompson, and I'm a software engineer at AWS. And my main focus there is on the JVM experience. So uh, I, had, I was a core contributor to the second generation of the Java SDK, which is kind of the programming APIs or the library that Java and JVM customers use to talk to AWS services. And then for the last year or so, I've kind of switched across to the client side, tooling side. So that's our IDE toolkits, um, including a recent uh, IntelliJ plugin that we open sourced. It's still kind of in developer preview, but that's what I've been working on for the last year. And it's kind of where I got my experience of using the Java library that I had previously worked on within a Kotlin environment. And these are some of the things that I kind of came across when I made that transition. So before we jump into the actual tips, I want to do a very quick trip down memory lane looking at the JVM language evolution. So in 1994, Sun introduces the JVM. A couple of years later, we get Java. And at this time, if you were going to write a library that targets the JVM, obviously you did it in Java, because it was the language that was around at the time. You've got maximum compatibility and interoperability, because everyone's using Java. Fast forward a few years, we get Groovy, a dynamically typed language. Uh, Fast forward another year, and we get Scala. So we've got a stat another statically typed language with some functional concepts in there. Immutability is a first class concern. Another few years, Clojure gets created. Again, this is a statically typed language with functional and immutable concepts, a list style syntax. And then the reason we're all here, uh, 2011, Kotlin gets introduced. Now, I think the interesting difference between Kotlin and some of the other JVM languages is the way it's approached interop with the rest of the ecosystem. So each of the previous languages that extended or ran on top of the JVM had Java interop as a first class concern, but most of them were only in one direction. So calling from the language back into a Java library. And that was really one of the big benefits of creating a JVM uh, language, because you got to take advantage of the JVM ecosystem. But they didn't often make it uh, good the other way around. Who here has tried calling Scala from Java? Yeah, I mean, it gets ugly pretty quickly. And I think Kotlin did a really, really good job of making sure the interop was in both directions um, through kind of annotations and some patterns that you can follow. Um, it's, it's almost in Java, it, it can be almost as if you're calling into Java. You don't even need to know necessarily that it's Kotlin. So now, as a library developer, we have a decision to make. We need to really think about the customers that we're targeting, and therefore, that's going to kind of drive what uh, language we decide to write our library in. You know, if we're um, writing a library that our Spark customers are going to use, for example, then obviously it makes sense to use Scala for the library because the application is most, most likely written in Scala. And now you've got maximum interoperability. Your library can make use of you know, the higher level types, the advanced generics, all that good stuff. Same story in Kotlin. So if we're targeting applications that are written in Kotlin, so I'm thinking things like Android applications and maybe IntelliJ plugins, then again, it makes sense for us to write our library in Kotlin because we get to take advantage of the standard library on both sides of the divider there. Now, as I mentioned, Kotlin has uh, done a good job of ensuring the interop from Java into Kotlin has a good story as well. And so it's totally feasible to vend out a, a library, a JVM library, to non-Kotlin customers. And they're still going to get a pretty good experience. The only exception there is that as soon as we start vending out a Kotlin library to customers, we start forcing them to take on the Kotlin standard library as a dependency. And I really like this quote from a senior principal engineer on the AWS DynamoDB team. Um, the, the crux of it is basically that dependencies are, are hard problems. And as much as possible, you should reduce the need for consumers of your libraries to, um, to have to pull in additional dependencies. Each new dependency is a new point of failure. Each new dependency is another potential version conflict.
And really, if we can avoid it, then we should. We want to make sure that libraries that we're vending out to customers take as minimal dependencies as possible and therefore force um, fewer dependencies on our customers. And so I still think if you're vending out a library that you want to maximize reach in the Java ecosystem, then it still makes a lot of sense to write that library in Java. Um, but that doesn't mean that we miss out on some of the cool things that you get in Kotlin. And that's really what I'm going to talk to you about today, is some ways that you can, um, in predominantly Java libraries, there's some tips for Kotlin libraries as well, but you can kind of maximize that experience for your Kotlin customers. Or you can kind of, th these are some lessons that I've learned that have tripped me up, so things to avoid, um, and so you can avoid causing pain for your Kotlin customers. Before we jump into that, though, I want to, I know I keep saying before we jump in, before we jump in, but this is the last one, I swear, and then we're on to the actual tips. I want to talk a little bit more about what makes a good library. So I've already talked about dependencies and how we want to reduce them as much as possible. Um, but also backwards compatibility is critically important as a library vendor. So what I mean by backwards compatibility is if you're following the semantic versioning scheme with your library, then a dependent application should be able to upgrade a minor version of your library without making any other changes to their application. They should be able to compile the application. The behavior should be the same. We need to maintain that trust. And that is uh, for multiple reasons. You know, if, if your upgrade path for your library is difficult, then customers aren't going to want to do that upgrade. And then what you're stuck with is maintaining multiple versions of the library. So it's really in our best interests as library developers to make sure that we maintain backwards compatibility as much as possible. And that's going to come up um, a few times when we look at some of these tips. Then, of course, um, simple and idiomatic, these are kind of standard things. You want your library to be as easy to use as possible. Meet your customers where they are, follow the patterns that they're used to, and don't force them to kind of learn a whole new paradigm. So with that, let's jump into the tips. And number one is probably the most obvious one when we're talking about vending out Java to Kotlin, and that is the ability to add nullability annotations. So we all know that Kotlin has a strong sense of nullability. It's built into the type system. Java does not. Uh, and I'm sure you knew this already, but you can kind of give Kotlin some hints about a Java library's nullability constraints using the annotations. Now, you can use uh, JetBrains' own annotations, of course, but the compiler will also recognize a number of other standard annotation libraries. And, and when I went back, back and looked through the code base, there's actually really quite a few. It's pretty impressive. So in order to make your library more consumable and more natural to Kotlin customers, it makes sense to use these, um, these annotations. But we need to make sure that we're using them in the right way and we're using them with care. So I'm going to come back to number two tenant here, which is backwards compatibility. So as a, a Java developer, when I add these annotations to my methods and I add them to my parameters, I'm really using them as a hint that something like a static analysis tool might use to ensure the health of my system, uh, maybe a little bit like documentation. But in Kotlin, it takes it actually a step further. And these annotations become a compile time contract to your customers. And once we issue that contract, we can only change the contract in certain ways in order for it to still be backwards compatible. So at a high level, it's kind of legal to loosen an input constraint. And by, by an input, I mean kind of the parameters to a method, let's say. Um, and conversely, it's OK to tighten an output constraint. So whereas previously a method might have returned something that was nullable, it's OK to switch that to not null. But the reverse can be problematic. And we're going to take a look at some examples here. So this is my first um, Java utility that I'm vending out to the world. And you know, I, I was staggered that we couldn't uppercase a string in Java. And you know, customers have been beating down my door for this one. So I'm going to introduce an uppercase utility. And because I want to appeal to Kotlin customers, I'm adding in the nullability annotations here. So my input uh, is non-null. I won't allow customers to send null into this method, but I might return null from here. So that's kind of what this contract is describing. And in Kotlin, I would call this in this way. So I'm passing in an instance of string, a non-null instance. And then I've got the, the question mark operator there, which is handling the fact that the return from this function might be null. Now, Kotlin, the compiler, forces me to add that handling. I can't directly call methods on the response because we've got those annotations. 
Now, I released this thing into the wild. It's wildly popular, as I knew it would be. Um, but customers are complaining that you know, we want to be able to pass null in here. There's certain times in our code base where it would be a lot cleaner if we could just chuck a null in the, into that function. And also, we really don't like the idea of having to handle nullable on the output. Can't you just default it to some um, you know, blank value or something? So you know, I've taken that feedback on, and I'm going to make some changes to my API contract. I'm going to flip those annotations around. So now the input is nullable. I'm going to accept null. I've loosened that constraint. And the output is not null. I've tightened that constraint. And as we saw in the rules before, uh, that is totally legal. So who thinks that this Kotlin comp is going to compile? Wow, one person. Amazing. This Kotlin is going to compile. That was kind of a trick question. Um, this was probably the only time I'll ask that where this actually will compile. Um, if you've got an IDE or you've got a warnings turned on, then the question mark operator um, might show up as a redundancy. You don't need that anymore. You're going to get a warning for it. But the, the code will compile. So we don't need that question mark operator anymore. We can, we can drop that out. Um, and now we also open up another way of calling this. We can pass null in. Um, and that's, a, again, a perfectly legal way to call this function. Now, I'm the maintainer of this library. And it's kind of getting annoying having to deal with the nulls as inputs. And there's certain scenarios where I want to be able to return null. So I want to flip these annotations back around. So I'm going to make that change. I'm going to put this out into the wild. Now, again, who thinks that this is going to break? OK, we're catching on. Um, yes, neither of these statements are going to compile. The first won't compile, obviously, because we're not handling the fact that the return type is possibly null. And the second is failing for that same reason, but also for the fact that we're passing null into the function. And that's not allowed um, by the terms of our, the contract that our library is, is vending out. So the bottom line on these annotations is sometimes um, Java developers kind of consider them to be hints. In Kotlin, they're more than hints. So we need to make sure that we're using them in the right way, in the right places. They can make for a much richer API. We just need to be careful about where we put them and kind of understand what potential changes we might be introducing into the future and what the backwards compatibility um, kind of implications are of those. So next up, number two, is Kotlin keyword shadowing. This is a pretty straightforward one. Um, Kotlin has a number of additional hard keywords in addition to the Java keywords. And so if we look at an example here, uh, again, I've got my amazing utility function this time, uh, or my utility class. This time, it's got an in method. Java, this is perfectly legal. In is not an identifier in Java. Or it can be used as an identifier in Java, rather. And so that's totally fine. But when I go to use it in Kotlin, I have to use the back ticks in order to be able to actually reference it. Looks pretty ugly, and it's it's something that's reasonably easy to avoid. Here's a set of the, um, this is basically the superset of hard, hard keywords that Kotlin recognizes that Java does not. So Java will allow you to specify these keywords as um, identifiers, um, but in Kotlin we'll have to back tick them. So I don't know if uh, many of you noticed that lintable um, kind of flag in the top right corner there. So uh, you know, it's all well and good me talking to you about these tips and kind of giving you uh, some of the, the problems that I've come up with. And you can you know, try and remember them and try and avoid them. But what we really want is the ability to automate these as part of our build so that we detect them and avoid them in an automated fashion. So for the tips throughout this that, um, I fit, that we could kind of detect through the AST, I've marked them as lintable. Um, and I've actually started a little open source project to implement uh, some check style rules around some of these, uh, which I'll go into at the end. So next up, tip number three, um, extension method shadowing. So you probably know Kotlin exposes a number of extension methods that you can call on any object. So apply is a good example of this. And um, we're going to look at another example here. We need to be careful when we're shadowing these methods. So again, I've got my utility class. I've stripped off the nullability annotations now so it fits better on the slide. Um, and using apply, I can call it in this way. Um, the this is kind of implicitly in scope, so I can drop that out of, the, uh, out of that statement. And what the apply block is going to do is effectively pass the instance of utility that I've called it on um, in the, the this position, so I can basically invoke any public 
functions and read any public properties on that. Um, and any mutations that I apply to it will then get returned from the apply function. So let's take a quick look at the signature here. This is what it actually looks like in the Kotlin standard library. Um, and if we blow out the generics because we know we're in a utility class, then this kind of gives us a little bit of a clearer view of what that function looks like in the Kotlin standard library. Now, again, with my Java library developer hat on, I think this is a really cool feature. Customers can inline mutate something. They don't have to assign it to a variable first. And so I want to vend this out to my other customers, my, my non-Kotlin customers, so that they can take advantage of this pattern. So I'm going to introduce a new method on my utility class. And in Java, it might look something like this. So I've got a consumer, which is a functional interface that takes an instance of a utility um, and returns nothing. It's, it's a void function. If we kind of translate this to, to Kotlin speak, then this is what the signature of that function looks like. Again, I've got a, um, a parameter, which is a, a lambda, effectively, or a function that takes utility and returns unit, so returns void. Now, um, you probably know the way extension functions work. If uh, an extension fun function matches the signature on the class that you're, the receiving class that you're calling it on, then the class's defined function will take precedence. So my Kotlin um, standard library version of apply is going to drop out of scope here, and the apply block that I've shipped as part of my library is the one that's going to get picked up. So who thinks that this Kotlin code is going to break? Uh, a few tentative hands. So yes, this, this will not compile. Um, can anyone tell me why? Exactly. So um, there's a subtle difference between our method definitions here. The inbuilt Kotlin standard library function uses the receiver notation, which puts this in scope automatically in my block. Uh, the Java version that I get here passes utility as a parameter. And so in order to get at utility, I have to explicitly reference it. So thankfully, Kotlin gives us a way to do this nice and easily with the it notation. Um, but I had to make a change here. And so the lesson here is really there's a subtle difference between some of these methods in terms of the receivers uh, versus parameters. Um, in this particular case, what we would have created had we introduced this apply method is a non-idiomatic uh, experience for Kotlin customers. They're expecting when I call apply on something, the block is going to have this in scope automatically, and I'm going to be able to call functions on it. And then most importantly, back to our tenants that we were talking about at the very beginning, if we were to introduce this at some point later on in our library, we have the potential to introduce a backwards compatibility problem, because we're going to break customers that were using the inbuilt one that now gets kind of superseded by the version that I've shipped as part of my library. OK, next up is property inference. This is a really simple one. I bet most people probably already know about this one and use it. But if you have a class that matches the Java Bean spec, that is, it has getters and setters for its properties, then Kotlin will allow you to access those things using property accessors. So let's look at a quick example. Um, again, I've got a person class that has a getter and a get name and a set name. And in Kotlin, I can access those things in this way. So I can just do direct assignment to the name uh, property, and that's going to delegate down to the setter. And I can do a direct get on the name, and that's going to delegate down to the name. And this is, this is probably pretty obvious, really not too much um, new here. But the reason I mention it is there are a number of Java, Java libraries out there that are introducing fluid accessors in favor of the Java Bean spec. So we're kind of dropping, we're seeing libraries drop the get and the set and kind of going for a more concise syntax, something that's closer to the accessors that you have in, um, in Scala and Kotlin, um, but still have the safety of that hidden behind a method in case you need to do validation and stuff like that. So um, here, the, the getter is the, the noargs name method, and the setter is the, the one that takes a string. Unfortunately, in Kotlin, it doesn't. It, 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 can't detect that. It doesn't really know the difference between this and what could just be a regular method. And so the way this is going to manifest for customers in Kotlin is they're going to have to call these methods instead of doing the property assignment that they might be used to. Um, maybe not a big deal, just something really to be aware of. OK, next up is operator overloads. So who's used Scala before? <laughs> 
few people. Okay, so in Scala, it's legal to define identifiers with a number of operators. So um, I don't know what the exact list is, but basically what you get sometimes in Scala libraries is methods with the name bang, hashtag, question mark, slash, stuff like that, um, which if you don't really know what they mean, you don't have a PhD in maths, then it can be really, really confusing what those things are, and it's kind of gone a little bit overboard. Kotlin also allows you to override operators, but it does so in a much, much more structured way. So let's take a look at an example here. This is a Kotlin class. Um, I've uh, implemented a dec, a decrement function on here, and it matches a specific signature that the Kotlin compiler is expecting. And because I've done that, I'm able to actually call it in this way. So I can just do minus minus on my countdown object, and that's going to delegate down to that decrement function. And if I'm writing my code in Kotlin, the thing that makes this work is this operator keyword. So what we're doing here is we're telling the compiler, hey, I'm trying to overload an operator here. Can you make sure that I've followed the right syntax and that I've, I've got the right signature? And it's going to give you an exception if you haven't. Now, obviously, in Java, if I'm writing a Java library, I don't have the operator keyword, so I can't use that. But thankfully, as long as I match the signature that the Kotlin compiler is expecting for one of its operator overload definitions, so if I have these Java methods on the left-hand side here, then in Kotlin, I'm able to actually interact with them in this way using the operators. I don't have to specify any kind of additional metadata on the Java version of the class. So that's kind of a, a nice way that you can add um, some kind of cleaner syntax to your, to your libraries. I particularly like the last one, which is kind of a Python-style set, um, set contains. Uh, I, just a personal favorite of mine. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a big, there's a list of the operator overloads as part of the documentation, so I suggest you take a look at that. Again, I've marked this one as a, a one that is potentially lintable. And I haven't implemented a linter for this, but my, my thought process here is that we have this set of operator names, and we could potentially um, look for functions that have been defined with those names and kind of warn you if you're not matching the signature that the Kotlin compiler is uh, expecting and kind of suggest that you know, maybe to get the maximum benefit out of this operator logic, you can change the signature. OK, number six, infix operator shadowing. This is kind of a similar theme of shadowing here, but it's a, a one that I got burned with, um, and so I kind of wanted to bring it up. Um, I know this is a little bit small. Sorry, it's, it's on the big screen, but I'll kind of run you through this quickly. So we have a person interface, um, which has an, a single abstract uh, property display name. We've then got an object that has, again, a single function on it that takes an instance of person and just prints the display name out to the console. We've then got an implementation of student that returns student for the display name. And our main function is basically just going to pass that student object to hello. And what we're expecting is that we'd get hello student at the command line. But let's see what actually happens. So huh, we didn't get hello student like I was expecting. What we got instead was some sort of tuple from the hello object to a student object. So what's going on here? What I'm going to do is I'm going to um, go back to my IDE, and oh, OK, I haven't actually implemented person on my student object. So why does this still compile? Clearly, the, the two function that I've specified in my hello object only takes a person. This is statically typed language. We should have the compiler checking this for me. You know, why is this breaking? And if I open this up in an IDE, and again, I know this is kind of hard to see, but there is a squiggly under there. Um, that was my, kind of my first indicator that something weird was going on here. So I popped open the, the quick help for that to see what the IDE had to suggest. And the first option there is, hey, do you want to replace this call to two with the infix form? Now, infix is a very similar um, concept to operator. You can mark methods uh, or functions as infix, and the Kotlin compiler will allow your callers to invoke that function without the, um, the period or the dot and without the bracket. So you get kind of the ability to kind of write DSLs effectively. But clearly, the, the two method that I wrote in my hello object doesn't have the infix operator. So something funny is going on here. Um, and then the, the third option there is really the kicker, add import to Kotlin.2. OK, so obviously I'm referring to something different here. So what, so what is actually being called? So I'm going to click into the to object that's being invoked in my IDE. And instead of taking me to my hello object, this is what pops up. 
So again, this is kind of a, an extension function that ships as part of the Kotlin standard library that's a shortcut for creating a pair. And it's an extension function that can apply to any object. So when the compiler didn't find a two on the object that I was targeting that matched the signature that I was passing, it went the next level up and was like, oh, OK, cool. I've got an extension function here that matches that signature. I'm going to map that in. So we've accidentally shadowed that two operator. It kind of makes sense when you think about what got spat out to the command line, because the two string for a pair is just a tuple. Um, and so you know, it, it all comes together in the end. But if you do this like I did and like I, I have in the example here, where it's a void function, there's no return type that's being expected by the customer. And so they can kind of implement this and happily go along their merry way. And the compiler is not going to warn them that they've done something funny here. This came up for me when I was using a dependency injection framework that had kind of a bind interface to implementation style syntax. And I bound my interface. I had my implementation. I ran up the application, tried to get an instance of that interface, and it told me it hadn't been registered. And it turned out it was because my implementation wasn't, ex wasn't extending the interface. So help your, cus your consumers out, your customers out. Try, not to try to avoid shadowing those methods if you can. OK, Varag's um, ambiguity. This one, I will admit, is a little bit contrived, but I thought it was pretty interesting, and so I wanted to include it. So let's assume that, again, we're shipping a Java library that um, has a join utility. So it's a Varag's method that, takes, um, that has two forms. One just takes the strings that you want to concatenate. The second um, takes an optional separator that you want to put between the strings. You know, probably a pretty obvious API. Now, in Java, we would call that in this way. And the reason I say this is a contrived example and that you probably wouldn't do this in a production library is that in order for Java to disambiguate between these two methods, we have to put the strings in an actual array and pass that as an argument, because um, otherwise it can't differentiate between the two methods, obviously. So the equivalent Kotlin code here looks something like this. I'm going to create an array of strings. I'm going to pass it into the join function using the spread operator. So that's a little asterisk there. Um, is this going to compile? No, this will not compile. So Kotlin is unable to disambiguate between the two method overloads, because when we do the spread, it's effectively got the same signature for both method calls. So maybe we can try and fix this. We're going to change our utility function so that instead of using string, the concrete type, we're kind of going to come up a level and we're going to use the interface, which is probably the way it should have been done in the first place. And so then what we get in Kotlin is it still isn't going to compile. So it still can't disambiguate between those two methods. We have to give it even more hints at the call site as to what we want it to do. So we need to tell it explicitly that the generic type I'm targeting here is a string. And then we have to downcast our hello, our separator object, to a char sequence. And at this point, it's able to kind of disambiguate between the, the two methods there. So as I say, you probably wouldn't do that in real life. It's a contrived example. But it's kind of funny how the differences between Java and Kotlin uh, can come about. OK, next up is destructuring. This is kind of uh, an interesting one. Who's used destructuring at data classes before? OK, yeah, pretty, pretty cool feature. So um, for those who haven't used it, just a quick rundown. So if I have a data class, so I've got a flight here, um, I can actually um, destructure that thing into its component parts with a syntax that looks something like this. So what this is going to do is it's going to take um, the delta string there from my flight object and assign it to airline, and it's going to take 142 and assign it to my flight number. And let's look, uh, kind of dive into that flight object to see how this does what it does. So I'm going to kind of decompile this back to Java. Um, and what we've got here, again, apologies for the size, um, but what we've got at the top is uh, a couple of private final variables. This is a, an immutable class after all. We've got the getters. We've got an all arg constructor. And then we've got these two magic methods, component one and component two. So that is what the Kotlin compiler uses to facilitate the destructuring. It literally just um, goes down the, the um, indexes of the, the things that you're trying to destructure and looks for a component method with the matching number and basically assigns that across. So interestingly, we can get the same logic 
vending out a Java library. So we can kind of provide this facility to our Kotlin customers by including those additional magic methods in our definition. Now, you probably wouldn't do it as an implementation, because that's going to be painful for every class. But you could do it as something like a default um, override on an interface. Uh, if you're in a land where you're generating classes, then again, this becomes a lot cheaper. Um, and what we can do from here is the exact same logic that we had before. So we can actually destructure our, fli our flight object into its component parts. So I guess a couple of words of warning here. Um, the first one is, unlike most of the tips in the talk, this one will actually have a material effect on your Java customers. So maybe one of the reasons why you're vending out a library in Java is because you want to, uh, you want to appeal to both your Kotlin customers and your other Java customers. Um, Java customers are going to see these component methods on the class, and they might be confused about what their purpose is and why they're there. So that's one potential reason why you might not want to do this. The other reason is a backwards compatibility one. So we need, in order to maintain backwards compatibility, you need to maintain the order in which these um, component uh, methods get generated. And even further than that, ideally what you would do is you would have the same order as the parameters in your constructor, because that is the kind of style that a Kotlin data class would expect. OK, number nine. We're down to functional interfaces. So um, as I mentioned, as I've mentioned throughout, the interrupt between Java and Kotlin is really, really good. And that goes all the way to um, inline function definitions. So if I were to have a, a utility that had a method that took a single um, Java functional interface or a SAM function, whatever you want to call it, an, an abstract class with a single method, then in Kotlin, I can actually uh, just define that function in line. And we get this nice, succinct, um, this nice, succinct uh, style of invoking that thing. There is a little bit of a gotcha, though. And that is, if I were to introduce another method that has the same name, um, it's, a, it's an overload, but it has a different functional interface, then suddenly Kotlin gets confused. It can't figure out how to disambiguate between those two methods. Now, this works perfectly fine in Java, because in Java, when you define a lambda uh, as an input to a method, you're forced to put the input parameters as a separate uh, part of your statement. So the compiler is able to disambiguate between which um, perform function you're calling here. In Kotlin, the parameter is brought into scope implicitly for you through that it variable, and there's nothing in your code that specifies whether you're trying to implement a runnable or whether you're trying to implement a consumer. Now, of course, uh, your callers can do that disambiguation themselves and kind of add that runnable cast, but it's a, it's a little bit ugly. So I suggest that you try and avoid cases where you have method overloads that are almost exactly the same except for a difference in a functional interface definition. So yeah. And, and, and the other point there is backwards compatibility. So if you were to ship the very first version of the utility that I had there, and then you add the second method later on, then you have the potential to break customers who are already using your library. So sticking with the theme of functional interfaces, I want to talk a bit about um, parameter ordering in, in function definitions. Um, methods that define a function as their final parameter uh, can actually have that function defined in line. We just saw that a second ago. Um, so what I'm going to do here is kind of display the reverse and how it looks, and then the, the happy case. So let's say, again, we've got our utility function. This time it's in Kotlin. Um, I've got my block, which is the thing that I'm trying to perform. And then I've got some sort of timeout duration here. Now, if I were to structure my method signature in this way, then I'm forcing my Kotlin customers to call it like this. So you have the, the inline function definition kind of wedged in between the method identifier and the rest of the, the signature, or the rest of the arguments that they need to pass. Now, most of the, in most cases where you see a function like this, the implementation of the block is the thing that we really want to draw attention to. It's the thing that's important. It's the thing that needs to be most readable. And having it wedged in between those other two pieces makes it a bit ugly. But luckily, it's a pretty easy fix. We just flip these two parameters around. And now the block is at the end. And this allows us to um, call that same method in this way. I can define the, um, the body of my function in line. And it's a cleaner syntax. It makes it easier to focus on the thing that's important at this call site. 
Now, in Kotlin, we also have the ability to specifically name parameters. So if you're wanting to go for maximum readability, then you can actually name the timeout parameter that you're passing here. This can be useful if you have multiple parameters as part of a method, or if you've used a, um, a default, uh, a default um, value for, the, for your inputs here. So I've added a, a default sensible duration that most of the time is going to be used. Um, Again, naming the variables there when you're actually at the call site is useful to disambiguate those if you have more than one. But also, what adding this default does is it allows us to get back to this nice, clean, single line perform for cases where I don't need to customize that um, duration. So what we've been looking at here is a Kotlin example. How would this map back to Java? It works in the same way. So again, if I put my runnable, my functional interface, first and my other uh, parameters after, then I'm forcing customers to do this kind of um, definition in between the other two parts of the call site. So, but by flipping them around, again, Kotlin customers get the same um, ability to define their functions in line at the end in nice, clean, succinct syntax. Now, obviously, Java doesn't have name parameters, and it doesn't have default parameter values, but it does have um, default methods on interfaces. And so what we can do is we can kind of emulate the, um, the default behavior here by adding an overload. And again, this lets us get back to the, the nice kind of succinct um, call site there with just uh, specifying when I'm calling this library the things that I actually care about. If I don't want to override the duration, I'm not forcing my customers to do that. So that's the 10 tips. I said 10-ish because there's actually a bonus one, and that is um, using your IDE to help you. So when you're writing a library, you're writing a library in Java, you might have some idea about how you want this thing to look in Kotlin, how you want your, your Kotlin customers to actually interact with this. And one really nice way, really nice tool that you have at your disposal to kind of back into that, into, into what Java you need to produce in order to get the, the Kotlin result that you're looking for, is to actually write out the Kotlin code that you want your customers to use. Um, or, or what you want your Kotlin customers, how you want your Kotlin customers to kind of interact with something. And then we can use the IDE to back into the Java that actually makes that thing up. So really straightforward example here where I've got a person data class. I'm going to, in the IDE, I'm not even going to pretend I'm typing. This is just a video. Um, in the IDE, I am going to go to Kotlin bytecode in the action toolbar. And that's going to give me the byte code that this Kotlin um, code is actually going to produce, which might be interesting, but probably not what we're looking for. We're looking for the actual Java code. Luckily, there's a decompile button. And what that gives us is the ability to come back into the Java code that would generate the same byte code. And what we can see here is kind of how we might add special methods and stuff to a Java class and make them available to our Kotlin customers. That's kind of how. Um, I came up with the, uh, the, the breakdown of that flight class before when we were looking at the destructuring. So it's a kind of a handy tool to use. So there's a, a kind of a number of tips, some gotchas that you can try and avoid. But, but what, do, what do we do with that information? Like I talked about before, the ability to kind of automate detection of it as part of your build process is a really useful tool. And so I've started to create a number of check style rules that can check Java code to make sure it's kind of adhering to some of these standards. At the moment, I've only got really a few identifier shadowing things implemented, but I've got a backlog. I've got a repository on GitHub. If anyone wants to contribute, that would be awesome. Um, in order to actually use this, it's, it's published on Maven, so you can just drop it into your build by adding it as a dependency to either your Maven or Gradle check style configuration. And then you configure the checks, and you're going to start getting warnings when you uh, shadow Kotlin hard keywords, for example. So if you use in or val or whatever as part of a Java function definition, and some of those extension methods that I was talking about. So some of those gotchas there. Um, as I say, looking to kind of expand this to add other checks in the future. So time for a summary. Um, I've kind of categorized these in terms of kind of the RFC style, must, should, may. Um, I think the first two there are things that we absolutely should do. 
Um, we shouldn't shadow Kotlin high keywords. That's a really easy one to avoid. Um, and when we do that, we kind of make it obvious to our Kotlin customers that we're not thinking about them. Uh, so I think that's a really important one. The varag's ambiguity, you probably wouldn't do that anyway. But as we saw, it becomes really, really ugly. And it's not a nice API that we want uh, to force onto our customers. So that's one to avoid. Um, and then we've got the, the should. And, and most of these um, come around the, uh, the realm of backwards compatibility and making sure that we're maintaining backwards compatibility among library upgrades for our customers. And then the ones at the bottom are some kind of nice to have, some things that would make uh, your Java library a little bit nicer to Kotlin customers. Uh, so that's your kind of operator overloads, adding destructuring, and following the bean spec if you want your customers to be able to use property accesses. So thank you, everyone. I hope that was useful. And I hope that uh, you had something you can take away. <laughs>